We began our preaching series on the Gospel of Matthew last year. This year, starting from Matthew 13 onwards, we started to study and to reflect and draw life lessons from the parables of Jesus as recorded in this Gospel. Just a preliminary word about parables. Jesus is rightly known as the most famous exponent of this form of storytelling. His parables have this special way of engaging the listeners' imaginations and challenging assumptions. Altogether, the Gospels record more than 30 parables of Jesus, covering a wide range of themes. Many of the more well-known ones are about the Kingdom of Heaven, which Jesus came to proclaim as at hand or near. And these parables often reflect or describe a familiar setting. They describe an action or a series of actions and then the result. And they often involve a character facing a particular moral dilemma or making a questionable decision and then suffering the consequences of that choice. In the past weeks, we have reflected on parables like the sower and the four types of soil and the story of the unmerciful servant and last week, Pastor David helped us to unpack the parable of the two sons and the wicked tenants. So today we are considering another well-known parable, the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 22. If you know the New Testament well, you will know that often Jesus uses the wedding feast as an image of the reign of God. And today he speaks of people who refuse his invitation or are unprepared for the feast. Let us bow for a moment of prayer and commit this time to God. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. Your word is life to us. We pray, Lord, that even as we look into this passage from Matthew chapter 22, that these ancient words will not become too familiar to us that we do not look beyond it into the deeper meaning and the insights that you want us to have. So Lord, we just commit our time of study and reflection into your loving hands. Holy Spirit, move and teach us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When was the last time you were at a wedding? Was it a joyful occasion? Did you enjoy yourself? One of the more interesting weddings that I happened to uh, have attended was last year in Brunei. It was the wedding of a business associate of mine and both the groom and the bride were um, connected to VVIP families. The celebration lasted two consecutive weekends and each time they gathered together, and it was hosted at the Empire Country Club, the biggest country club in the city, um, thousands of people came. Uh, everyone was dressed in their best, and the atmosphere was full of warmth and smiles. Regardless of the size of the wedding, if the bride and the groom are dear to you, their loved ones, you would be glad to be part of the celebration. Everybody loves a wedding. So imagine that you are in the wedding in this parable that is retold by Jesus in Matthew 22. So you show up at this wedding of the king's son hosted by the king himself but lots of people are not there and then you hear that they refused many invitations and reminders. And they even ill-treated the king's messengers. So you see the king tell the staff to go off and invite everybody else. And they do. After all, the celebration is going to go on for a long time. So many people come and the celebrations begin. And then you see the king going around greeting the guests one by one. And he comes upon someone who can only be described as a gatecrasher. 
This person was welcome to attend, but he showed up wearing a singlet and slippers even though every guest had been given a new set of wardrobe upon accepting the invitation. So this man's way of dressing and his demeanor of entitlement showed a great deal of disrespect to the king. So the king decides to have this person thrown out before your very eyes and everybody gathered there. And he's prosecuted for trespassing with malicious intent in full view. Now, if you were part of that crowd listening to Jesus tell this parable, what would you think? In whose shoes would you put yourself in this story? Now, Jesus has told parables before, and the wedding feast is, of course, indeed a familiar setting for his listeners. And by now, you must know that Jesus did not teach in parables to provide blanket affirmations for the way we understand God or ourselves and other people. He taught in parables to invite us to re-examine some of our most cherished convictions about things that are of eternal importance. And for this reason, Jesus uh, tells parables that are intended to unsettle us rather than to reassure us. It was a Mexican poet who said this about art, that it's meant to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And indeed, it applies to the parable as an art form, at least the way that Jesus told them. So if you are puzzled or you are provoked to thought or perhaps even upset that the host of a wedding, an important and powerful man, would behave in this way, then you are not alone. What does it all mean? So let's dive right into the text and you will see, uh, and I hope you have a Bible open with you, uh, that in Matthew chapter 22, verse 1, Jesus, it records, again Jesus spoke to them in parables. So the king sent his servants to call those who were invited to the feast, but they would not come. And then he sent other servants saying, everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. But they would not come. The parable records that the invitees not only refused to come, they mocked the king by disrespecting and ill-treating his messengers. The passage specifically says that these invitees paid no attention. They went off one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. And the third thing that we see in this part of the parable is that the king was justly enraged. He was very angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. So there were judgment and there was dire consequences. Now if we follow the chronology of Jesus' ministry, when Jesus tells the parable, it is about one week before uh, the Passover and his time is coming close. So Jesus is no longer hiding who he is. Like the parable that he told before this one, there is a sober warning that time is running out for people to repent of their sins and to come to God. And the question is whether the people's hearts were so hardened that they were unmoved by, sin, by, the, by a knowledge of their sin and they could not see which group of people they belonged to in this story. So in this parable, Jesus is represented by the Son, the King, is God and Jesus is describing here the offer of the gospel first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. The Jewish people had rejected the offer that God made to them through his prophets and even now they rejected Jesus himself. Jesus both the messenger as well as the good news 
And this rejection was especially strong coming from the religious teachers. John's Gospel states their reaction. In John chapter 1, verse 11, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And so for that rejection, Jesus announces the judgment of God will bring within a generation of his coming. And we know, history tells us that in AD 70, about 30 years after Jesus uh, was crucified and rose again, the Roman armies destroyed Jerusalem completely. So what happens next in part two of the story is that the king tells his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited are not worthy. So go to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Verse 8, verse 9. And it records also, the parable says, that the servants went out into the roads and gathered all that they could find, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the king opened the invitation to everyone else. And many came and they were honored guests. Isn't it wonderful that in God's providence, that rejection by the initial invitees is the occasion for the gospel and the good news to be extended to the Gentiles. And the result is that the wedding hall was filled with guests. So this parable, like many others that Jesus told, shows how the lowly and the poor and the meek are the ones that Jesus came to save and to serve, to free and to uplift. Not the rich, not the self-dependent, not the religious who go about with this air of superiority, but the weak and the lowly and the oppressed. And coming to the third part, of this parable it records that when the Jesus, when the king came in to look at the guests he saw there a man who had no wedding garment and he said to him friend how did you get in here without a wedding garment and he was speechless the man was speechless then the king said to the attendants bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So it seems that among the people at the wedding, there was a man who was not dressed appropriately. And when he was challenged, he had nothing to say in his defense. So by the king's command, he was tied up and he was cast out into the darkness. What does this all mean? For one, the man represents somebody who had some desire to enter the kingdom of heaven, but would only enter on his own terms. That is unacceptable. There is no excess except by the terms that are laid down by the king. And then we also know that the attire, clothes, are used frequently in scripture as a metaphor to refer to someone's conduct and character. We see that the metaphor is used often by the Apostle Paul in his writing, and especially when he's writing about the old man and the new man. He's always commenting about how the external is an expression of the inward spiritual condition. So coming back to this parable, here is a man whose dress, which is his behavior, shows no evidence of a changed heart, but was a blatant display of his unfitness to be among the true guests. There is a Bible commentator by the name of J.C. Macaulay who also writes that it seems the wedding garment mentioned in the parable refers to the robes of righteousness that dress a person 
who accepts what Jesus has done. It is not something that we have done ourselves. It is not something that we possess, but it is the righteousness of Jesus with which we clothe ourselves so that we can stand before God and be found worthy and acceptable. And when I read this insight, I put myself in the shoes of the listeners to Jesus. I think that such a profound insight could only come through the spiritual eyes that were opened by the Holy Spirit and not by merely explaining this parable as a story. So, what are the lessons that the Holy Spirit would teach us through this parable today? There must be several, but I venture two. First, the invitation of God through His messengers is not something to be taken lightly. It is a summons to a disobedient people who have a to have a right relationship with God. And God will surely hold those responsible who refuse that summons. The day of judgment is for that very purpose. And here is the thing. Jesus also wants us to realize that it is possible for someone to say that they want to go to the wedding feast. To say that they want uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven. But it is only lip service. This might be the equivalent of uh, RSVPing to a wedding banquet. Not saying yes, not saying no, maybe saying maybe. How rude, how disrespectful that would be. There is no true yes of the heart. There is no true embrace of Jesus. There is no true surrender. There is only wanting the benefit on one's own terms. But the parable tells us that such lip service is tantamount to a refusal and it is subject to God's holy judgment. Actually, it is biblical reality that no human being has any power in himself or herself to change a rebellious heart. This is bad news. But the good news is that God himself is the first to reach out to us, working in us through the Spirit to turn us to him. No doubt the Holy Spirit worked in some of the listeners as Jesus walked among them and taught them and healed them and loved them. And so salvation is truly by grace alone. Jesus wants us to find salvation and life in Him alone, by grace alone. He is the way to the kingdom. He is the truth and He is life itself. So that first lesson is that the invitation of God is not to be taken lightly. The second lesson is simply this, that Jesus' mission, His proclamation of the kingdom of heaven is actually an invitation to joy. Just like any of us, when we are invited by a loved one uh, to a wedding, we would happily go. If we care about that person, we want to be part of the celebration. In fact, we are honoured by the invitation and we would happily go and join in. The celebration. Jesus is the true bridegroom who has invited us to a wedding feast. He came to bring peace to the troubled, forgiveness to the guilty, joy to the downcast, freedom to the enslaved. And that's why the Apostle Paul says to the Philippian church, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Philippians 4.4 4. And the Apostle Paul is right to say that there is enough joy in Christ to completely overwhelm all our troubles and heartaches. This is a big part 
of our testimony and witness to a world that is lost and in great need of hope. So God's summons is indeed an invitation to joy, not only temporal joy, but joy everlasting. Let us spend some time in reflection about today's message, and I suggest three questions for us to ponder. When you are ready, do share with one another and pray for one another. And may the Holy Spirit of God, our counsellor and friend, enlighten and encourage us and show us the way forward. The church elders and pastors send our blessings in Jesus' name to each and every one of you.